So the process then of doing this, remember, was divided into transcription and translation. And during transcription, there is another important molecule that I want you to know, and this is called RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase also unzips the DNA molecule, breaks apart the, the double strand, and it, then it leaves open the t uh, a side of DNA to become the template strand. And as the RNA polymerase runs down the strand of DNA, it then makes a copy of that gene in RNA. And so you end up with your, this newly made messenger RNA. So the way that, that it does this is the RNA polymerase sits down just upstream of where the gene is. So this is before that, what we call the start codon, and even um, uh, a few nucleotides before that, upstream, the RNA polymerase sits down on an area of the DNA called the promoter site. Then it moves down and finds and, and starts to make a copy of the message that includes a, a little bit of the DNA just above the start codon and goes all the way down until and it includes a little bit of DNA even beyond the stop codon. Then it hits a region called the terminator DNA and that is when the RNA polymerase knows that it now is done and it lets go of the DNA strand and you have a completed RNA strand. The three words that we use for this process is initiation, where it binds and starts to move, elongation as it goes away, all the way along the gene, and termination when it finally lets go of the DNA. And that's the process of transcription. Now in eukaryotes, there's one other thing that needs to happen, and that is called RNA processing. So here's the DNA, we, we go through and do the transcription and we get this RNA product. But notice that in eukaryotes you have different parts of the genetic message called exons and introns. These were named by Walter Gilbert in 78. Intron refers to the intragenic region, so the regions between the actual genes or between the information that is really genetic information that's going to be used to make the protein. So it's as if the introns are just spacers, just fillers. And the exons are the actual expressed regions. These are the regions that are going to be expressed. So as you might imagine, we don't want the introns. So after you make the copy of RNA, the introns are remo removed, and then the exons are spliced together. Spliced in molecular biology means pasted together. And now you have the coding sequence all put together as it should be put together. You also add caps and tails that, uh, that help protect the, the the strand and also allow the um, binding of the ribosome to happen. And then now it's ready to go outside of the nucleus. Just as, a, as a, an aside right now, I want to talk about something that's really important, and this is called alternative splicing. It turns out that in eukaryotes you can actually sometimes splice together exon 1, exon 2, and exon 3, or just exon 1 and exon 2, or just exon 2 and exon 3, or just exon 1 and exon 3. And so you can have these alternative ways of splicing together these exons. And this is why you, even though humans only have you know, 20,000, a little over 20,000 genes, we can make more than 200,000 different kinds of proteins because we can alternative, alternatively splice the different exons together to make slightly different proteins. And this was a uh, huge discovery just made in the last uh, 15 or so years. The next part of the process then is that once that, that messenger RNA leaves the nucleus is to then to undergo the process of translation. So the ribosomes are the sites where this occurs. And so I just want to remind you of the structure of a ribosome. It has a small unit and a, and a, uh, and a large subunit. In the large subunit, there's what's called the P site and the A site, and this will come into play. You'll see that this is where the, um, these transfer RNAs, a different molecule that we have in our bodies, um, come and dock in these different sites. And then we also have this groove that comes through here, and this is where the messenger RNA is, is uh, attached. So let's put it all together. Here we have the ribosome in blue the messenger RNA that we just made through the process of transcription, and then, as I said, we have these two docking sites, and this is where you have these transfer RNAs. So these are RNA 
that fold up on themselves and they have two important parts. On one end, they have an amino atta uh, acid attachment site, and on the other hand, they have what's called the anticodon. And as you may guess, the anticodon has the, um, the corresponding bases to attach to the codons, right? And we'll see that in just a moment. And so when it's all put together and working, you basically have from the P site, you have the growing polypeptide, and then in the A site, you have the next amino acid that's going to be added to this growing polypeptide. So let's start this off. And again, they use the same um, uh, words to talk about this of initiation. So in initiation, everything comes together. The ribosome grabs onto the messenger RNA, and the first um, um, tRNA is brought into place. And we know that the first tRNA that is brought into place is always the same tRNA. It's the start codon. Remember, that was methionine. And that is um, AUG. So the anticodon that is part of the tRNA would be UAC. In every case, that's how it is. Okay, so now we'll move on to the next part of the process here where we'll see what will happen now that the A site is available, it's ready to receive the next transfer RNA to bring in that's going to have the corresponding anticodon and so therefore it's bringing in the correct amino acid. And so that occurs and then you go into what's called translocation, or I'm sorry, first the peptide bond formation. So once that site gets filled, then you form a peptide bond, which is a special type of covalent bond between these amino acids. Then the P site lets go of now the uncharged tRNA, so this tRNA that now does not have this amino acid. And then you have translocation, where everything shifts down, and the growing peptide chain now goes into the P site. Now the A site is ready to receive the next amino acid. And this just keeps chugging along. You know, it's kind of like pulling, remember a tape um, player that would pull that magnetic tape through the magnets and you could read the mu you could read the message and basically play music. Well, that's kind of what's happening. It's pulling this message through and at the same time it's making this growing polypeptide. And that continues until you hit the stop codon. So a basic review then of this whole process is once again you start with the DNA, the RNA polymerase comes in, copies, makes the messenger RNA, the, that RNA is then processed, exons are spliced together, it comes outside, runs into the ribosome, you start with the very first start codon and then you continue to do this process again and again and again until you're done with the polypeptide. Once you hit the stop codon, the ribosome knows to let go and the polypeptide is now fully um, formed. In the meantime, by the way, off to the side, these tRNAs that are being used are called uncharged and then an enzyme goes through and reattaches the, the correct amino acid back to that tRNA and it becomes charged and then it can be reused again. So that's the entire process of transcription and translation. Now it's appropriate to briefly talk again about mutations. This was one of our mechanisms of evolution. But recall that a mutation is simply any change in the nucleotide sequence of DNA. So now that we know a little bit more about DNA, you can see that a change in, the, in for example, the second position here, recall that the second position always is going to change the amino acid. So that T became an A, which therefore in the mRNA, instead of being GAA, which codes for glutamine, it's now GUA, which codes for valine. Well, that one mutational change causing a one amino acid change makes hemoglobin go from normal to become sickle celled. So when, DNA is, when mutations occur in DNA, they can be silent, and a silent mutation is where it doesn't change the amino acid. Recall that that might be very common in the third position, where it didn't matter which third position nucleotide it was, whether it was a G, U, a or C, it all it coded for, in many instances, the same amino acid. So that would be called a silent mutation. A missense is when it swaps one amino acid for another. That's the case I just showed with um, the example in the previous slide. A nonsense mutation is where that mutation causes the amino acid to change to a stop codon. You can imagine that's a big problem, especially if that occurs in the middle of the gene. If you introduce a stop codon in the middle of the gene, you're going to make a protein that's half as long as it should be, so it's going to be a non-functional protein. That's usually a lethal mutation, meaning it, it's not a good idea. Um, you can also have mutations of types that are called insertions or deletions, and this is where extra nucleotides 
get inserted into the message or or nucleotides can be deleted out of the message. And this can be a big problem in coding DNA because if you just insert one, that means you push everything down and you do a frame shift and so you completely screw up the message downstream of where that insertion occurred. Other types of mutations in DNA are translocations, which is where one chunk of DNA moves to another part of the chromosome. Inversions, where you have a chunk of DNA that gets turned around and then reinserted in the same place. And even chromosomal changes, like non-disjunction events, and even polyploidy, where you're copying multiple, multiple copies of, of chromosomes. So these are all types of mutations, but for the most part, we we're mostly look at substitutions, insertions, and deletions. Now, mutations are a process that occurs naturally, okay? but the rate of mutation can be increased through mutagens. These are physical or chemical agents. So you're familiar with some of these, right? Like UV radiation, smoking, x-rays. These are, the, that's, you know, when you go get your x-rays down at the hospital or, or something, they put that big lead blanket over, over your body, especially over where your gametes are being produced because you don't want to increase the rate of mutations. Increasing the rate of mutations is not a good thing um, and many times can lead to cancer as we'll see in our cancer discussion. So although mutations can be harm harmful, mutations are necessary for biology. If all of a sudden we could wave a magic wand and say no more mutations, very quickly genetic drift would get rid of variation and we would basically come to a dead end in life on planet, uh, into much of life on this planet. So we want to have v variation in biology, and mutations are the ultimate source of all diversity in the living world. They're the ones that contribute to this, this variation that then natural selection can see. Remember, natural selection can see variation and say which variants are going to be most, um, are, are, which variants are most adaptable, right, are going to survive better, and, and you start to have evolution that happens. And so mutation is an important part of, of evolution and biology. And so just remember, not all mutations are bad, right? So with that, we'll end our talk on DNA structure and function.